Good evening, everyone. This is Film Snobbery Live, and I'm your host, Nick LaRue. Uh, we have another fantastic show for you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you are a first-timer here, let me fill you in a little bit. Uh, this is film Snob part of FilmSnobbery.com. Uh, I am a film critic. I work with independent filmmakers, and I review independent films, and we have independent filmmakers and guests on our shows. Uh, we attend film festivals, and we do other fun stuff. We also do script coverage if you're a film uh, screenwriter that's looking to kind of... Uh, you know, make the next um, uh, move in your career. We've got some wonderful uh, coverage readers that are just itching and waiting to read your scripts and uh, give them a little bit of polish for you so that you can uh, put your best foot forward out there because it is a competitive marketplace. So uh, we have a wonderful show for everyone. Um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but there are these things out there called pilots. Um, <laughs> and we have someone here who has experience producing them, and uh, or at least the one that he, he just did, uh, called Canusa Street, which gonna, we're going to show you the trailer of, uh, or for, in a couple of seconds. Um, so we have a gentleman by the name of Zach Morrison on the show tonight. He is cool because he is uh, was nice enough to um, be interviewed for my upcoming book, uh, Behind the Scenes of Indie Film Marketing, a film snobbery field guide, which will be available, uh, I think, for pre-order in May, and I think on shelves in June. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. I hope everyone really gets something cool out of it. Uh, so um, I'm not going to kind of do too much more because um, I, I want to get to our guest and chat with them tonight. Uh, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to cut to the trailer for Canusa Street, a pilot by Zach Morrison. And then when we come back, we are going to talk to the man, the myth, the legend about making that and screenwriting and festivals and a whole bunch of shit. So hopefully uh, you guys and peoples out there enjoy it and we will see you back in a couple of minutes. About this. You are illegally trespassing inside the United States and will hereby be deported back to your country of origin. Welcome back to Canada, Mr. Bigwood. Yep. Thanks, Holly. I think taxpayers will be proud to know I stopped a geriatric Canadian from getting his Zamboner on. I have a case for you two that's sector priority. Quebec is sending their best officer. No! Harley Trudeau, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Nice to see you too, little sis. Shut up, you're only older than me by like two minutes. Did you two know each other? I was hoping you'd be a little excited to see me. I'm more excited for one of my kidneys to fail. Just let me, just no, let me, No, no, I let got me. it, I got it. All my life, she's been one step ahead. Can you even be here right now? My bedroom's Canadian. Did you lose track of your horses? Please, we haven't mounted anything in years. <laughs> that is for damn sure. Okay, let's go. I'll drive. Nope. It's weird seeing all these houses built on the border like this. They say drunken surveyors got the whole thing wrong. And both countries were just like, whatever. You guys ready for the big game tonight? You guys better bring your A game. It's game day, I'm just amped, all right? One, two, three, USA! Don't worry, Holly. I, for one, love hockey. Who said anything about hockey? Is that even how you spell Rodriguez? I never spell my last name the same way twice. And we are back, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Zach Morrison. How are you tonight, sir? I'm good, I'm good. How are you doing? I, well, you know, I mean, I have mirrors, so I know, I know what's up. 
Um, well, but, thanks uh, so much for having me. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Actually, I'm really happy to have you. I mean, I, I know that um, you've been out there promoting Canusa Street for a while now. First, when you were uh, trying to get the stuff, you know, getting ready to make it. And then obviously now you're on to the, you know, you've made it. And now on to the next step, which is it must be released unto the world. So yeah. how let's talk about how is that going for you? <laughs> It's going. It's going well. We um, we started our. Excuse me. I'm dealing with uh, the cold that I think everyone is dealing with this time of year. Um, yeah. No, it, it was going really well. We we started our film festival tour in July. We pre uh, premiered at the um, at Dances with Films in Los Angeles at the Chinese Theater, uh, which was really fun, amazing festival. And then since then, we played at the Nashville Film Festival in Nashville. Uh, multiple film festivals in New York City, upstate New York, New Jersey. Um, and as as your title card just showed, we're uh, screening back in Minnesota uh, where we shot the pilot um, at the Ely Film Festival in February. So it's, it's going well. We already have dates on the calendar for this year. I'm expecting an L.A. screening, maybe a couple more East Coast screenings coming up. We have a little bit more uh, in 2024. So it's very exciting. That's awesome. Do you um do you have a favorite film festival that you've been to? Because I'm I'm assuming this is not the first project that you've brought to festivals, right? Because I think was it you you also had a Panic Attack in D minor, right? D major, yeah. D minor. D minor, D minor is a very not fun musical key. Um, no, yeah. So I mean, that was that was my my Columbia University MFA thesis film. It's called Everything's Fine: A Panic Attack in D Major. It was like a 15 minute musical comedy short. I mean, that's what brought me out to LA and kind of got me sort of starting in the industry in the first place. Um, I, I mean, it, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have like one favorite because I feel like there are so many, there's so many great, there's so, like the, so many big ones that are great. So many super small hyper locals that are great. Um, you know, I know I'm kind of both sizing it for you, but there's just, there's a lot of, a lot of good, a lot of good film festivals out there that I, we've been fortunate enough to be a part of. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's this, it's there's a place for everything out there, which is really exciting. Well, all right. So I'll flip that question a little bit on its head. Then, what do you feel makes for a great film festival? Ah, uh, I mean, it, it depends, right? I think it, in general, you know, the the festivals that understand that filmmakers are are coming to attend, I think is is really important. You know, the ones that. Uh, you, you know, that even like little things that provide like multiple badges for your your film to attend because obviously there's multiple people on your crew that might want to show up. Um, the ones that have after parties at night for the for like oh we're in the middle of nowhere in this town let's let's have a shindig going on at, at some place you know the um, festivals that have a, have a venue that's like a movie theater and not you know the the library on a projector attached to a police station which was one festival we screened at that shall go nameless. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just the, it, it's, it's event production, which is a world I know nothing about. So like critiquing it is always, always kind of hard, but it, it, the, the ones that, you know, whether it's big or small, the ones that kind of foster that community of we're all artists, you know, the kind of Zac Efron, we're all in this together thing. There's no VIP section red tape we're all just kind of people hanging out like those are those are the festivals that i really like yeah i agree with you um yeah the after party thing for me is always as i'm getting older i find myself less enamored by them um not that i don't love the occasional free drink but the uh yeah the the, the idea of uh, being in a town that you're not familiar with and wanting to experience a little bit of what people their experience is definitely something that you know i i i think is part of that festival experience. Of course, like there's a little bit of networking stuff that kind of comes out of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, so how have you, you've already kind of said you, your calendar's kind of chock full with Canusa Street, um, which is fantastic, by the way. Congrats. And I'm very familiar yes. actually with uh, uh, Dances with Films. They've, they've um, that's another, uh, um, uh, Leslie Scallon. Uh, Scan, yeah. Scan, yeah. Uh, she's also in the book. So. Oh, nice. Uh, so, no, Les yeah, Leslie's, Leslie's really there. great. Uh, apparently, yeah. Um, so, uh, let's, um, yeah, so we talked about a little bit. Do you, do you find it's more difficult to conceive the thing, make the thing, or get the thing out there? 
uh, when it comes to making, whether it's a pilot, whether it's making a feature, whether it's making a short, just a, you know, whatever. Like, do you find that the, 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 in the process of pre-production, production, post-production, and then of course, you know, distribution, where do you find there to be like, all right, I'm, this is the part that always gives me the most, um, troubles, maybe not the, the, the right word, but you know, like, it's like, this is the thing that like, I know that I'm gonna have to spend a more effort on. Oh man. I mean, that a hey, great question. Uh, Thank I, you. I, think, I, I mean, I think like product, like production's hard, right? The, the act of doing the thing is hard. And I think there's it like, then I'm not trying to diminish writing because writing is like, that's, that's a craft. I love it. I, you know, it takes me years to write a thing. It takes some people a day, right? So writing is incredibly hard to craft. Like a good script is very hard. Because you can you can write a script and it, and then you can kind of vomit one out and then that's great. But like to 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 make to have a script that's ready to go that's actually like oh this is not only written and done but this is good. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. But I do think the logistics of actual production are something that a a lot of writers who aren't filmmakers don't necessarily consider. And then also just it it it, it takes a village. Like it really does take a lot to make five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, your 90 minute feature um, to the, to the point that like nine times out of 10, I find that we're not even thinking about distribution. We just need to get the thing made. And then, then we have, that's a whole different conversation of what do we do with it after um, that said, you know, the more you do it, the more you kind of start thinking, all right, where does this fit? Why are we making this thing is a really important conversation. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think it's a miracle that anything gets made yeah. or, or rather gets made well. I mean, you can shoot something and it could be fine, but you know, the, for me, it's always been like a quality over quantity situation. And I'd rather, you know, I, I, I did all the like kind of do it live college shorts for no money where we're staying up all night and not sleeping. And those were fun and awesome when I was 21, right? <laughs> Um, 10 years later now, I, I'm trying to, you know, it, it's, it's super like productions, like shooting the thing, being on set. That's what kind of gets me jazzed about every, I mean, every, even the stuff I'm writing right now, you know, um, I, the idea of maybe this thing that I'm writing on paper, we're going to shoot one day. Like that's really cool. Uh, also super expensive and you, you're the captain of the boat and there's all this pressure and you have to perform and do your job and, you know, that stuff's hard. So I think like, you know, of the three, writing just takes me on my desk. There's like the emotional energy that goes into it, but production takes 50 people and a town willing to let us take over. I gotcha. Do you, do you ever get, when it comes to the production side, because I think, I think I agree with you in the point of like, writing is like, it's a thing you can do. It's a thing many people can do, but you know only some people can do it to a degree of. Um, I I think a lot of things could be adapted to make things work, but maybe there's some you know there's 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 not everyone can write a feature and have it be uh, palatable enough for an audience on a first go for it to be you know the shooting script. Um, I mean, if they want to do that and then they want to finance it and they want to, you know, waste money on whatever and maybe something happens, sure, that happens too. But, um, but I guess, you know, I, I, this is me trying to not offend people who are like, ah, yeah, but yeah, I, I like to write. And I'm like, yeah, but then there's writers and then there's people who do it for a living, you know, um, of which we just saw, you know, an entire however many months of strikes about people that are trying to get more value for that profession, um, which I want to talk to you about as well, because you you were, you were, um, you were on hand on both coasts for shit like that. And I'm really interested in like a, your kind of almost like man on the street take from it. Um, but, uh, but going back to like the thing, yeah. do, Do you get, um, do you get, imposter syndrome at all like from when you're like okay i finished this uh script and now i've got to even after you've got the money to make the thing right so do you go like oh my god now i've got to go onto a set and i have to make this thing a reality is there ever like that moment or several hundred moments of imposter syndrome that kind of kick in that you kind of maybe go oh no and then how do you get over that 
Oh, all the time. Yeah, I mean, that's the, I'm in a, I'm in a constant state of what am I doing, you know? Um, but that's, that's the job. Like as, as an artist, I feel if you, if you don't inherently feel a little bit of self-consciousness as an artist, to, I don't understand what that's like. Right. I mean, I think, you know, we're, and that's not to say that we're all constantly head cases and we're, you know, the world's out to get us. I just think that, you know, there's, there are so many times where it, like on Canusa street, I'm like, oh, wait, are we doing, we're doing this? Holy shit. This is crazy. Right. Or as I'm right, as I'm writing it, like when specifically with Canusa street, I wrote it and I told, we did a table read in 2020. This was my like pandemic kind of fuck it project. Like I need to do something to stay sane. Yeah. Um, we did a table read like mid to end of 2020. And I re distinctly remember telling all my actors and I, ha I still have the email. I'm like, Hey, by the way, um, let's, when we, when we do this, let's not worry about logistics or production. I'm never going to shoot this. So don't worry about it. Right. And cause you know, I think the, the biggest, one of the biggest things I learned as a writer is I, I was writing very small scripts because I, I had in the back of my head, it was like, Oh, I have to shoot this. So right. I can't write like Stargate or some crazy fantasy Lord of the Rings thing, because I'm never going to be able to shoot that with my like limited indie filmmaker brain. Right. And I, one of my uh, like screenwriting professors in grad school was like, write something uh, assuming you're never going to like, you're never going to make this. So just like free your mind. Right. Yeah. And it was a great exercise in, um, in, in writing something like kind of broader and more conceptual and, you know, like Canusa Street, it's it's based off of a real town. There's a real town where you know this line kind of cuts the town in half. But like I, the I, the I, idea of freeing my brain to the point where I can be large and funny um, was was an exercise. But at the same, like you know, so going through the process, I was like, oh, I'm never going to shoot this. You know, is this funny? I don't know if this is funny. And I think every comedian goes through that that phase of like, I have no idea if this is funny anymore because yeah. I've been, I've been with it for so long. And I have to imagine in a, pan get... in a pandemic too, like you're, um, you're not exactly workshopping. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, it's like, we're, we're literally in an echo chamber in our yeah. own, you know, 2020 was, was strange for a million different reasons, but we had no way of, of doing material and we would do it like zoom table reads and zoom comedy. And there were so many things, but it was still, you weren't getting that, instant gratification of or just oh there's no laughs i can't tell if this joke is working or not right, right? cuz even if there are laughs zoom laughs are like delayed and it's weird and it's silent and you know um but so from the writing side it was strange cuz i i was like i guess I, I reached a point where i was like i guess this is good and we just have to move forward with it but then this was the first time i ever fundraised like serious money for anything. So there was the imposter syndrome of, am I really asking someone to like invest in this? I've never done that before. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, then when we get to, um, you know, we're find location scouting, it's like, wait, am I like, I'm talking to the mayor and the police police chief of this town. What's like, is this is so like, I feel like every step of the way was just a learning curve, you know, in terms of it was the biggest project I've ever done. It was the most, uh, moving parts of anything. It's the first time I ever opened like an LLC for, for a production. So that there was, there were so many different, what am I doing moments? Firsts. Yeah. Oh my, yeah. so many, so many firsts. Cause my last project before this TV pilot was a 15 minute musical that was fully financed off of a production grant from grad school. So like the, it was like, Oh, Hey, your budget's 10 grand. I'm like, great. That's what we're doing it for. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll shoot in my house, my parents' house and it'll be great. Um, do you, but, do you, I mean, as you look back on that, and I know it's not even fully in the rearview mirror yet because you're still kind of in the distribution phase of this, like you're still getting out there at festivals and stuff, and then the idea of like, well, then what, you know? But as you kind of look at that um, and where you are uh, now and look back, does you look at all those firsts and go, that wasn't as hard as a lot of people make it out to be? Or, like, I thought that was going to be harder. Like, maybe in the moment, you know, like, it's like, oh, my God, I don't know how to do this. And whatever, you know, like, an LLC, that sounds like something that's very high adulting. Um, but, you know, uh, then you find out that, like, you can just go on to LegalZoom and they'll freaking do it for you. Or, like, you find out <laughs> just that it's only a, a few, it, basically it's money. Like, just give them money and they give you shit back. <laughs> 
Um, and that's really how easy it is to do that. And then the, 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 the real bitch is like every year when they have you do your annual report and then you have to pay more money and then your licenses and whatever. That's when it becomes more of like, oh, I hate this. I hate this. But the tax breaks are nice. Um, right. But uh, yeah, do you feel it like the, that, uh, you know, filmmaking as a term is tough um but it's just a sequence of steps that just need to be checked off in sequence and then you know and, and it's not as hard as all of that as long as you you kind of go in somewhat prepared i mean i think like the at, at the end of the day it's the um it's the nine p's like the pr properly planned pre-production prevents piss poor post-production. I just going in it's like the Boy Scout model, like being prepared, right? Like I think that's the, that's the, at the end of the day, the thing. Yeah. And I think for me, everything was a learning curve. It was so many firsts. Um, on the one hand, I think it's a testament to um, the, my, the, my producer, Carver Israels. We were classmates at, at film school together at Columbia. He is awesome at what he does. And, you know, I, I, I trusted him to do the things that he is good at. Right. So I think I got fortunate in the sense that I had a partner in this that uh, is just is great at his job and I want to work with him on everything now. And, but also, you know, I am recognizing that even just for, like on the fundraising side, right? Like these are all of the, these were all the asks I was going to make for a first feature, but I spent, 15 years building up these relationships to the point where I could go to people and say, Hey, you, you know, you know, me, you know, my work, you know, you know, like now is, this is, this is the first big thing. Right. And so there's definitely a, you know, the, there's the, the privilege in having that network that I spent my whole career building right to the point where I can go to people and cause fundraising, you know, it, it's, it's hard and not everyone has access to those things. And I never did, until this moment. And so, um, it, like it, it just, there was a lot of like learning, obviously learning on the fly and, and just, but it, it, I think this project was the culmination of, of, you know, an entire life's work leading up to this point. So, cause you know, even I I've been hustling and trying, you know, I've known I wanted to be a filmmaker since I was nine years old mm -hmm. and it really truly has been like the singular focus you know, in, in my, my whole life. So even since when I was a kid, yeah. so um, it's, it's, I think it's just been like literally just following the path and one foot in front of the other. And, you know, I had a, I had a short film that, that did well in the festival circuit and it, it won an Emmy and it kind of got me in a lot of like kind of clout within a very small bottom level of things. And, you know, this project just felt like the next step. And I think something that, you know, I've noted with not even peers and friends, but just kind of people in general. It's like you can live in short film land, yep. you know, and then but eventually you have to sort of do like the the first big thing. And it's it's a very hard it's a hard decision to say, oh, no, we're doing this like yeah. and we're not just talking about doing it. I'm not imagining doing it like we're actually this is happening. Yeah. And I think there is a palpable shift in not even like the imposter syndrome of it all, but like, is this possible there was a palpable shift the moment we stopped saying, I want to do this. And we started saying, we're do like, this is happening. Yeah. Like the literally, it was just like the train already left the station at that point. And just, you, we could feel the momentum change yeah. in, um, it just in, in every conversation we were having just the like mentality shift. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. There was the mentality shift and it, 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 the imposter syndrome went away. Cause then it just became, Oh no, you've directed before you, you like, you know how to do this, right? It's like any athlete that's ever dealt with the yips. It's like, no, it's like, you, you know how to, you know, you know how to do this. You, you've been doing this your whole life. You know how to do this. So it's, um, I don't know. It just, it, it, it was, it, so many different things were right place, right time. And I forget what your original question was, but it, you know, <laughs> no, the, it, you, you answered the original question and actually, you know, kind of even going back to something you said before about like thinking bigger. And I think that that's something that, um, a lot of independent filmmakers tend to, um, I think they fixate on independent filmmaking without remembering that like independent film does. And I've said this before, not I don't know if I said it on the show, but I know I've said it like in, you know, meetings and shit like that, where it's just like independent film doesn't have to be a death sentence. You know what I mean? Like independent film is supposed to be a stepping stone to 
a, a career in the creative arts, whether or not you decide to continue being in filmmaking or going into television, whether or not you're directing, producing, <laughs> writing in a room with other people, whatever. I feel like like the idea of like these people hold on to like, oh, it's uh, got to be truly independent. Everything else is a sellout. Everything else is this and that. And it's like, uh, it's a sellout if no one wants to buy it, you know, well, you know, um, you yeah, know. And, and I don't I, I don't know if those things are mutually exclusive either. Right. right. Like, I don't know. You know, you can look at I mean, you have a Kevin Smith poster behind you. Like, yeah. I think Kevin Smith, obviously, you know, his first films were very independent, but he's also made big commercial stuff. And and but he but he still he has an, he has a horror film that he made super indie that's coming out or it might not ever come out he I think he released it on NFT or something yeah the NFT uh, um uh, Kilroy yeah, yeah Kilroy yeah, yeah. Kilroy yeah, and, I yeah. mean you know and I'm I'm from New Jersey so Kevin Smith is always you know he's always been like you know our he was our Ken Burns or uh, I don't know who like a, a bigger indie indie guy would be but he like he was always our guy like oh if he can do it we can do it you know yeah. and so I um. I, I think the I, the idea of an indie like indie film, it can be it can be good if you want it to be good, right? It, yeah. You know, you can have broad strokes comedy and it can be indie. You can have big budget and it's it just it can it, it doesn't have to be like a lesser thing, right? Right. And I think no, no, for, yeah, I think that like yeah, that's not to minimize independent oh, right, film, right? It, but it is to be like you know. I, I see a lot of filmmakers who go and they make their film and then when they fail, they'll, like they'll make that first film, but then for whatever reason, like the, they fail at making that second film or that third film or whatever. And then they kind of just give up or quit or whatever. And it's just like, well, there are other avenues within this industry that aren't just trying to raise money on Indiegogo or Kickstarter or something like that. And then making something else or talking to dentists and getting investors and stuff like there are other jobs and you can use what you have as this proof of concept because you already have done the work to, to kind of get in with these various things. Now, is that going to work for everyone? No, I mean, it, it is what it is, but you know, I think that there's, there's a mentality that becomes like, if I'm not this, then I'm not, in, uh, like it's not indie or like it kind of almost like a very punk rock mentality in a way you know you have those like the terms that people throw out like oh fiercely independent and stuff and i'm like i'm all for that you know in theory and then i'm also like but then what like even even johnny rotten had to grow up you know to some degree i guess oh i mean you know? look i would i would love nothing more than someone saying you know here zach here's all the money uh go go do star wars 37 yeah. Right. Like I would, I would love that. It's like, I, I grew up because New Jersey had a really big, like ska punk, like it was a punk scene, but it was all like sort of the ska bands and real big fish was something I listened to a lot in high school and they had that song sell out where it's like, yep. you know, you're going to go to the record company. They're going to give you lots of money. And I was like, I, that'd be nice. You know, that'd be great. Yep. So it, I, again, but you can still, it's like, it, but it all comes down to what are you writing? What's the story? Is it, is it good? Is it, you know, and I think as an artist, you can, you can do commercial stuff and it can still be stories worth telling. You can do the indie stuff. And, and it really just comes down to like you make one project and not necessarily what's something bigger that you can do, but what's the next, what's the correct next step for you as an artist, right? What's something that like the next project, is it going to be a step forward for you? Are you going to be saying something new or are you going to be trying something new? Or are you just kind of sticking in your lane and that's it, you know? And it, it just comes, comes down to what you want and, for me, Canusa Street felt like the next step because, you know, I I, ha I did a bunch of shorts. I did like a, 10, 20 short films and and now I wanted to do something bigger and I thought it was going to be a feature, but it, like I had a bunch of feature scripts that I was kind of playing with and just Canusa Street as a half hour comedy was just sort of the script that started getting industry buzz. Yeah. Like it, it, there, it, blew, it was, I was working at the, it was the Kids Tonight Show. It was a spinoff of Jimmy Fallon where like eight year olds were hosting the show and I was the script coordinator for that. And one day I had to step out of the office because my phone was blowing up because it got like 150 downloads on the blacklist in like a two hour span. It was wow. just like bing, 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 you know, the, all the notifications. And I was like, what, what the hell is this? Um, and, and then a month later, it played a Catalyst Festival in Minnesota where it won. And just so it just like it just started becoming this undeniable thing. And then that's where that momentum, like the train was leaving the station feeling started to happen. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe we have to shoot this like this. Maybe this is the thing. And that was the, 
you know, the, the conversation I had with my first investor, again, like a relationship I was kind of developing for years, right, before it even became, before I even knew what the script was. Um, and the conversation was always like, hey, you know, you're making these shorts. I, I believe in you. This is great. When the time comes, when you have the big one, give me a call. And then I, you know, once Canusa Street on, on paper started, you know, it was getting eights on the block list and top 1% red list on cover fly and winning this festival and doing this thing. Once it started kind of becoming this like undeniable, like the momentum was there. I, I went to that, I went to that guy and, I, and he was like, Hey, is this the big one? What is this? Is this the project? And I was like, yeah, yeah I think it is, you know? And, and so it just, it was the first time I ever asked and you'll never know until you ask. Yeah. And that was, that was kind of it. Yeah. I, the worst they can say is no, but you, again, I mean, it sounded like he was almost chomping at the bit trying to be like, just let me know. Like I'm here for you. And that's great. But I mean, it, you know, it, it's not always nice to know that like, someone has that level of trust in you and belief and all that kind of stuff. And I think everyone needs that kind of champion. I taught, you were talking about Kevin Smith a little bit ago. I mean, there was a, there was a thing where he was talking about his relationship with Scott Mosier and, and, you know, back in um, film school and then, you know, their relationship as his producer yeah. making clerks and stuff like that. He goes, he was my friend that didn't ask why he just asked, why not? You know, like, and I always believe like if I can be or, or whatever, be that person for other people, um, that's that's valuable. I think there's not enough people that go when they go like I don't know if I should do that and just having someone go like why not? What's the worst that could happen? You know what I mean? Right. I mean there, there's limits to that, of course, but um, you know uh, heroin. Well, why not? No. Um, <laughs> well, but, I mean uh, that that's kind of it's kind of what the pandemic like it put a lot of this industry into sort of that like yes and perspective for me because. Yeah. You know, I, I look, it's and I'm not trying to downplay how much work went into this project, how much work goes into projects. I'm not trying to say like, oh, just do it in like a uh, um, toxic, positive kind of a yes. way. Right. Because yeah. I think there Hustle is a lot of like stuff. Yeah. All yeah there, there's there's a lot of like, oh, just shoot your film out there that I think is like kind of over like oversimplifying. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to do that. But I think especially when we were stuck inside for a year and then we had two years and then we, the industry went on strike for basically the whole year. And so within the, the time that I've lived in Los Angeles, two years have kind of been this like super introspective, what am I doing with my life kind of a thing. Yeah. And I, like during 2020, something that I, I kind of realized is like, I felt like I was waiting for my career to start setting aside the fact that, that everything shut down, like going into 2020, I was like, um, um, I don't know, 2019, uh, 92. What's, what's that math? 27. 27 I was like 27, 27 years old. I was like, I, it's just not I, it, like, what, what, what's the secret thing? What am I waiting for? Why hasn't it happened yet? I was kind of going through all that. And then, then, then the world shuts down and I start writing the script. And part of the conversation around Canusa street was like, what am I waiting for? Yeah. Right. Like as a filmmaker, I know I, this is what I want to do. This is my life's work. I spent my entire everything like in my life wanting to move forward in this, in this career path and to be a filmmaker. And I felt like I was waiting for someone to tell me, okay, that here, permission. like here. Yeah. Right. Like I was, I was waiting for permission for it. And it, it, it took the world being on fire for me to realize like, what if like, I, I need to just, I need to do this for myself. I need to make this thing. If it bombs fine, I, at least I can say that I've, I went all in on one thing. Yeah. Right. And so I think like, I, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's scary and it's intimidating, but I'm glad I, I went on this journey of this one thing because at the very least, if I don't make it, if, if I go down swinging and I find myself, I don't know, doing something else in 10 years, I can at least say like I I I tried it once, right? It ended up working out, and we're now having we're it's it's good. I like it. I'm glad you liked it. Like we're you know yeah. I want to do the next thing now, but I I felt the need to at like I had to put myself out there in a space of vulnerability and and try something that I've never done before, as in like raise money and make like a, kind of a professional non student project, um, and it just it kind of 
it took like being stuck inside for me to realize like I have to I have to do this. I have to take ownership over over my own life, right? As as an artist. Um and yeah, I just I don't know. It 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 was hard to say it was hard to like to find that okay, we're doing it mentality. But once you had it, it's easier to keep going, yeah. right? How was the let's let's pivot over to those strikes for a minute because you're absolutely right. Like, you know, there was this period of time during the pan, you know, the start of the pandemic where um, you know, there was everything was very introspective, everything was solitary. Um, there was a lot of this was also a lot of the time where people in in almost every industry were evaluating their their worth, not only their self-worth, but their worth to their employers, uh, their value, uh, etc. Um, it seemed like that had tend that continued and then over to, uh, you know, there just happened to be these contract negotiations for the WGA and SAG-AFTRA and all that kind of stuff that were kind of coming in line. And, you know, I think that there was opportunities, uh, that, um, were taken advantage of and then some left on the table, uh, to, to kind of, um, rectify some of these things. Uh, you were in an awesome position where you were kind of bouncing between both coasts and so you kind of got the vibe from both like New York and also the, the lines in, in LA. Um, one thing I would ask is like, what were, what were, what's your biggest takeaway from the strikes as a whole being someone who was there with all of those people? Um, I mean, there's so, there's so, so much to sort of, you know, I, I mean, on the one hand, I think, a, it's amazing that that WGA and SAG got everything that they, they got. We, we got we got the deals that we needed, right? I mean, I think that's like for like first and foremost, um, it was a successful strike. I think, right? I mean, it it, it there's no it, not, it was it, it sucked that it took that long, and that that everything that was eventually won was on the table in March. So like there, there's some frustration there. I mean, I think on j just from being like on the picket lines from both coasts and I was lucky that I had a a non-industry survival job that I was traveling for. So I was able to like have work and, and that was sort of why I was going back and forth. Um, but I mean, just the spirits were high. Everyone like it, it, no one was felt at least from what I saw, like everyone was in high spirits that there, no one's resolve was broken. You know, I think, um, it just it, it was it was a very interesting moment in history in the industry to to sort of be there literally on the ground and i think i met so many incredible people and heard so many incredible stories and i think yeah. that uh you know i many good things are going to come from it um and, and i i know that you know i i don't think there's anyone that i met who feels unsatisfied with the results yeah no i i have um i have friends who were on the negotiating committees on both on, on both uh, the WGA and SAG-AFTRA who are really involved in a lot of those um, negotiations and stuff. And I get a lot of the frustrations in certain areas, um, you know, things like AI and stuff like that and, and some of the, the residuals aspects um, and stuff like that. I get it. Um, I also, I you know, but I think that, I think that there was definitely a moment that was experienced for the industry that put a lot of, what we do in perspective. I think some of that frustration and anger too was like, it, it's the same thing you kind of hear about for like fast food workers and hotel workers and stuff. Um, when, you know, during the pandemic, everyone shut down, it, you know, so who became the essential people? Oh, entertainers and people who made right. the food. You know what I mean? And people right. who like, you know, took care of you, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, hotel, you know, service industry people. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, I think it became a, um, you know, uh, there, there, there's, oh, um, I think you're seeing a, a shift in that um, in multiple different, uh, you know, in, in multiple different ways. Like, I, I know I'm rambling at this point. Um, I think that, like, I, I think where I'm going with this is... Um, Did you see, I mean, this, this is a, the, the, maybe the dumber of the questions I'm going to ask, but I'm going to use this question to get to the next one. Um, <laughs> this is my buffer question. Uh, 
did what was the bigger bigger differences between the uh, morale and or the attitudes of the people on the lines from the uh, East Coast versus the West Coast? Uh, no, I, I I mean it was all the same. I think you know everyone. I it was in, incredible how positive and united everyone was, mm -hmm. whether it was East Coast or West Coast. I didn't really sense a difference in that. I mean, I think like I met more late night writers on, on, on the, the East Coast, just because there's more of more of them there. On the, and there's way more scripted writers on the West Coast and the all the schedule A and, you know, the, the variety comedy writers needs were that totally met and, and earned, but like different, I think, than what the majority of the contract sort of talks about like a lot of the you know the the late night variety stuff is like an addendum at the end it's not even you know yeah. so they're just the, what we're what we're fighting what was being fought for were, were was different but and yeah. like the morale i mean everyone like it was incredible how positive and united and welcoming and ex like just everyone was in a great mood they were pissed off that it, it came to it you know but like i don't it, it was I think in contrast to the pandemic, the existential dread wasn't there because everyone knew it was like everyone knew it was going to work. It was just a matter of time. And there was the common enemy of like, well, it, you know, I think the most frustrating part was they came back and, and they, you know, it's like these terms were on the table from the beginning yeah. and you just kind of wasted the whole year and tried to starve them out. And then there was that like the article of we want the writers to be homeless and yeah. like it was just PR disaster after PR disaster. And you know, that was the stuff we made fun of on the, uh, the YouTube show. But um, yeah, no, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I, it was, I think, like I said, a lot of good things are going to come from it, both, both from people working in the industry, but also I think like indie is going to have like indie film is going to have a huge opportunity. I think, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that in the same way that after 07, 08, there was that web series boom with like high maintenance and Broad City and Booth yes. at the End and Secure and Always Sunny. Like, you know, I think we're going to have a similar similar opportunities for, for independent creators, I think, are going to just pop up because all of these streamers, they need like you need they're going to need affordable, producible material, yeah. you know. So, no, you're right. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it was something that I, I was been talking with a couple of different people recently about, like what happened with web series. Like there was this that idea that this was going to be the next big, like whatever. But yeah, it, I mean, Netflix happened, and and yeah. you know, all, Crackle and and all Hulu and all these things happened, and, and things either got bought, sold, whatever. But then, kind of, it just became there was some cream that rose to the top, and everyone else just either found different careers within the industry or they just went yeah away. it was it was sort of like because 2012 what well when did when did lily hammer launch when was lily hammer and house of cards on netflix that um, that um, was or that was yeah i think that was about 2000 yeah between 2010 and 2012 wasn't yeah it? I'm, I can I'm looking look it up i'm, I'm <laughs> looking i'm looking up right now because um uh and it, it launched in house of cards uh 2013 okay yeah okay. so so 2012 is when we had like we had high maintenance was getting picked up uh, it was on vimeo and then it went to hbo obviously we had um uh, broad city was was a thing for a while insecure was happening uh drunk history was happening like this the web series had it, the moment again post 2007 when like youtube sort of exploded and it like YouTube was actually a viable platform that you people could discover your material yeah. and audiences were going there for narr there was so much incredible narrative work that was happening on YouTube, mm -hmm. like right before 2013, because when like Lily Hammer launched and that was a fun show, but no one really knew what Netflix was yet. Then House of Cards launched. And now that totally changed everything because now web series wasn't, you know, uh, uh, Nikki and Alana d shooting their show on like a DSLR in Brooklyn. Now it was David Fincher is directing high level stuff, yeah. right? So it like the it, the indie like web series like House of Cards was a web series at that time because we weren't recognizing Netflix as television yet, right. and so all of like who, I don't 
like audience is like, I'm not going to watch some no, no budget produced thing when I can watch House of Cards. Yeah. And so then we had like the six years of like Netflix ex exploding and Hulu exploding. And then, yeah. you know, and, and then, then Netflix decided to get into the awards game. Their whole thing was we want to be taken seriously as a production house. Right. And so we are going to just throw shit tons of money at Hollywood and then the awards game and all that. And once we get all the awards, then we get the respect. And that's when Amazon and Apple and everyone else jumped on that too. Yeah. And that, and that's also when like YouTube creators, like no one, like people were just audiences didn't need to go to YouTube for character, for narrative, yeah. for sketch, because it was all on, they had it on their streamers now. So that's where also like video game, like gaming on YouTube kind of took off and like vlog. That's when Casey Neistat's vlog kind of exploded um, because like YouTube it's YouTube was always a place for the thing that's not being widely, you know, widely done. And now like the, the fit, the camera, you know, you're like the, the like, Hey, what's up? It's me. I'm doing this thing. Like you're, that's when vlogging kind of became a thing. And, you know, any kind of non character, just forward facing talking, Material happened. The, the um, joke on that one is the last words as the bombs fall will be like and subscribe. Hashtag like, like and subscribe. Smash that like S button. Smash that. You know, ring the bell. Ring the bell. <laughs> right. And, and and then so now YouTube's become a platform for that. So now, um, you know, like to to launch a web series on YouTube is kind of silly in 2023. To get back to where I was going with this is I think that now in the wake of the, the 2023 writer strike, I think studios are going to maybe I'm projecting into the universe selfishly for Canusa Street, but also in general, I think like I'm hoping studios are going to begin taking a chance on smaller, like the kind of stuff that Broad City was or high maintenance was in 2012 and 2013. What's the equivalent of that today? And I think that it, like, that's where indie film I think is going to have the same moment that it had in web series land back in like 09 and 2010, you know? Yeah, I remember, I think it was the CW at one point had like this online kind of um, sister channel where they're, they were like putting web series on that were kind of like experimental to see if like what the audience response was with the idea that they would get picked up and be brought over to like they would get production deals. I remember that we, this was years ago and we had Jane Espenson on and Jane Espenson, you know, for the folks out there who aren't familiar, she worked on Buffy. She worked on Battlestar Galactica. She worked or Caprica. I think, uh, she worked on, um, she's very, very, you know, uh, even more, most recently, she's got a, a couple of shows that have done that have been out there. Um, real well, she's a showrunner, very well-known showrunner. And um, she did this, uh, she produced this, this web series called Husbands, uh, Husbands the Series. And that ended up on, being on there and did really well, but then it didn't end up going further with that. But there, was, there were opportunities, and I think you're right. I think especially with, you know, the cost of stuff like that and cost being a big factor right now with a lot of things because a lot of, uh, of the larger streamers are a little more overextended on the production side. Um, but, uh, you know, that, I think that also is a, um, it's interesting because this dovetails a little bit into, and I don't want to get, I don't want to get too much into it because I just don't think we have enough, enough time. Um, uh, but, the uh, the, the idea of like, um, I just saw a, a, an email, I got an email today that someone else forwarded me that, uh, like, you know, right now a lot of web series, uh, not web series, sorry, uh, filmmakers are going to like Tubi or Freebie yeah. or, you know, right. some of the smaller streamers and stuff like that as Ooh. a as a way to get distribution. And the problem is that all of these things, like I remember when Netflix was a distributor, Amazon was a distributor, not a production house per se, you know? And so, you know, there's no, you know, and, and so independents aren't really getting onto those platforms anymore. So to go to what I was saying, um, it looks like Tubi is going to start doing in-house production now. And if Tubi starts doing in-house production, that means they're going to be more selective about what else gets on their platform, which closes another door for filmmakers. So the question is that as these doors get more and more closed, where do you see these things going? Or is it, you know, basically now it is, it's like, oh, well, hone your fucking pitching skills because you're going to be about to do the water bottle tour uh, more often than you'd like. I don't know. I mean, it, I, the thing is, we don't know. You know, we don't yeah. like. I don't know what 
what Tubi's plan is. And I, I mean, I think, you know, Tubi and Freebie and Roku with, I mean, now they're getting into originals with the Weird Al movie. Yep. Um, and so I think, cause they also, they also have the whole Quibi library to, to deal yeah. with cause they, they bought Quibi. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's exciting because we're figuring, you know, the industry is figuring out these problems where we c- like just straight up the reason streamers are crashing is cause they can't spend $10 million on an episode of television for every show all the time. Right. And I think that's what the big lesson here is it, it we're kind of circling back to not only we're we circling back to like cable as like a, a model, yeah. right? Bundling. But like, you know, the, I think the reason at you look at Abbott Elementary getting an 18 episode full season order on network television, which hasn't happened in like 10 freaking years. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, studios are beginning to realize like, hey, there's a reason that we we shot shows like in in a three wall sitcom, there's a reason that those TV shows work because we could generate 22 episodes, 25 episodes a season, and the the engines of those shows would just spit out material for seven, ten years, yeah. right? There's a reason that Cheers and you know Friends and like all of these shows happen in Mash. It's like you know, where you're, maybe, where you're only spending maybe a million an episode. You know? Not and some, sometimes not even right. Like it, you know, and so I think the the idea of like you know we've passed peak TV where we don't I don't need every show to be a nine hour multi million dollar movie. Yeah. Like it's, it's okay. It's okay to tell small contained stories. Like that is okay. Sometimes consumers want that. And I think that's that, like Ted Lasso kind of struck that nerve of like, oh, maybe we can have like a small story set in a in like in relatively low stakes, you know. Ted, Ted Lasso is therapy for men, and, you know. Yeah. And, and, and not saying it's not enjoyable by everyone, but I have never connected with and wept more openly with a TV show in my life. Um, but uh, that said, too, I'm going to circle it back over to Canusa Street because yeah. you know one one thing I want the audience to definitely know here is that Zach is a he's a fucking you know uh, Swiss Army knife as a writer because you have that late night variety experience, you have pilot experience. You know, you've written your own stuff. You've written with other people. First thing I want to know is what is some of the big differences of writing for writing in a writer's room, you know, with other people for something very specific, like a late night, you know, episodic kind of thing uh, or late night uh, variety type of thing versus writing episodic where it's a little bit more um, if you're doing it in the writer's room, I think you know, obviously that's. You know, there's there's a, a different uh, thing there, but, uh, you know, writing a pilot, I would assume, is a lot more. So, uh, solitary um what what are some of the differences and what makes a good writer to be able to adapt in those different ways that was a weird weirdly phrased question i admit but no it's it's all good i mean i think it, it, if we if we want to zoom out for a second i think a better comparison is screenwriting like writing a film and writing for television because right. if you're like if writing if you're writing a movie like screenwriting is a very solitary thing that's you in the page that's the Quentin Tarantino, like lock yourself in a cabin in the woods and turn out reservoir, do- reservoir dogs or whatever, you know? Um, and, and I don't, I don't enjoy that at all. I hate writing in a vacuum. It's not how I, I love being around other people and throwing like, you know, we're let's, I mean, that was what grad school was. That's what, that's how late night does it. I've, I've never worked in a, a scripted room before. I would like to, if anyone's listening, I have material, I'm ready to staff, uh, but no, but I, I think like that's it, it's a very communal experience writing television because, you know, there you have there's just a, a bunch of different brains in in the pot and and we're making a product better than the sum of its parts. And I think there's a magic of the writer's room that I think is very, very important. I mean, and that was one of the big components of of the the negotiations during the strike was like the preserving the writer's room as part of the craft, as opposed to it just being these like nine episodes written by the showrunner, because, you know, just to point at an example, if there were three other people in the writer's room in game of Thrones that had the ability that were on equal footing with those guys, I think the last couple seasons would have, would have been a little, little bit better because you, you, you know, if you're writing a movie where it's like a contained thing, then sure, totally. Like, let's just like, that's the writer's vision. Sure, I get it. But in television, I think the magic, some of your favorite episodes have come from pitches from other writers. Yeah. And some of the best hours of television that, that you can think of all came from the skill of the, the the writer's room as a group, as a unit, as opposed to, 
uh, like the showrunner's vision because no one cared about that until Marvel, right? Yeah. Like no no one no one cared about oh did they plan the story in advance yeah. until until Marvel happened. Yeah. You know, and, and so that, from a TV perspective, I think also like when you're talking about peak TV, like stuff, that's when also like Mad Men or, you know, like those kind of things where I think the showrunner became more uh, looked at as like an auteur versus. Right, like, but even, but, yeah, but Vince Gilligan like has oh, Breaking like Bad, yeah. with Breaking Bad, like Vince Gilligan has famously, famously credited his writers in a way like, he, you know, like that show had a writer's room. Right. I mean, I think people think of like. Aaron Sorkin and like and been these writers of like these auteurs, but like West Wing had a writer's room, even though Sorkin took credit for every episode, like there were writers on that show. And so, you know, and there's always that one, and I, for, I forget his name, but there's always that one show that's like, oh, but that guy wrote every episode. And I'm like, cool, great. Every, like your favorite shows have been written by committee. Yeah. And that's just how television has always worked. And that's the reason it works well. You know? that, that leads me to what will probably be my last question, but I think it'll be some one of the most the more fun ones, which is um, what were some of the I, I could I spotted some of the influences uh, in Canusa Street that you kind of um, had uh, in terms of the writing style, joke style, you know, uh, structure and stuff like that. But what are some of your bigger influences when you're writing um, specifically for Canusa Street, but just in general, like. What is like, what's your style? What is like the thing that you like to borrow from? What is the thing that you like? Oh, I love that Brooklyn Nine-Nine does this. I love that Cheers does this. I love that Married with Children does this. Like, what are you, what are those shows for you? And what are those like, those kind of archetypes that you're like, if I can work that in, I know that works for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you met like Brooklyn Nine-Nine was a huge influence for Canusa Street. Very overtly. Like I'm a big, I'm a big Mike Scher fan and, and Andy Samberg and, I grew up on like SNL and everything. I mean, as I think most people have, um, but like Canusa Street, I, we, we definitely, I definitely leaned into specifically the pilot of Brooklyn nine, nine, but also just the structure of that kind of a show as a model for Canusa Street. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, you look at the teaser and the first act of, uh, of Brooklyn nine, nine, and you play it like side by side with Canusa Street, there's a lot <laughs> There are a lot of like visual overt parallels there, um, but I mean, in general, it you know it it really depends on on the project. I mean, with I love like I love self aware shows. I think that you know like I if sometimes it's, it's if if characters are kind of aware they're in a television show, I think that's always fun. Um, you know, but but also just like my favorite movie is The Blues Brothers, and I think yeah. what what The Blues Brothers does really well is there's like a level of like realism and absurd absurdity that are constantly at odds with each other. Uh, and I think the reason Canusa street works really well is because all of the absurdity is coming from truth. Like that is a real town and there's a really a place on the U S Canadian border where there's a library that sits on the border and there was a smuggling cr crime that occurred in this library. And like, that's, that's all, all real life. And so I, I love like taking little things like those small things in real life that I think that we take for granted and just like really blowing them up to, to ridiculous proportions. Like that's always fun for me. I feel um, like you may have been a, uh, a police squad naked gun uh, fan at some point uh, in terms of that absurdist humor that's yeah, rounded Pink, slightly. Pink, Pink Panther was, I think of, of that genre, I think Pink Panther for me, like shot, shot in the dark is one of the funniest movies ever made. Like I, it's just, that that whole that whole thing I think is great, um, but yeah, I mean like Police Squad, Naked Gun, um, like the the dumb cop. I mean it's Dogberry from yeah. Much Ado About Nothing, right? Like the 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 trope of the dumb cop to me has always been one of the funniest things. Yeah. Um, and I know. agree with I also agree with you about like the skirting the line thing on uh, like the Blues Brothers. It's like you know what's fun. You know what's funny is like being chased uh, through a mall by like two or three cop cars. You know what's really funny though? A 25 cop car pile up. Um. But, what's, but what's funny about that scene, like that, the mall chasing the Blues Brothers is funny, not because of the absurdity of the car chase, yeah. but because Jake and Elwood are not reacting to At the all. car chase. At all, yeah. Right. This place like, has it, everything. Like, <laughs> right, it's like, oh yeah, like they're just, we're just chilling in the mall. Like that, that's why it's funny. Same yep. with when the, when Carrie Fisher does either the rocket launcher or the flamethrower or one of the million different ways. They never react to that. Like they don't react to it. And that is why that's that like absurdity that that's the reason it works. Like when they jump over the bridge, 
they're not reacting to the fact that they jumped over the bridge. They're reacting to the fact that, J you know, Jake wants Elwood to fix the cigarette lighter, yeah. right? So that, that, that's, it's just, it's, it's almost uh, like Monty Python-ish, where, like, we're just not going to talk about the joke, yeah. right? Like, that kind of is funny to me. Let the joke sit there and be the joke. Right, just let it, let it live. Yeah, I got it. Uh, you know what? We're, we're kind of at the the end, unfortunately, because you're one of those few people that I, I you may not feel the same about me, but I feel like I could talk to you for hours on end. Um, no, it's always, it's always great. I love this. No, it's fantastic. Thank you for coming on the show. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find you, where they can find Canusa Street and anything else that you're working on? Yeah, so I'm, I'm at uh, like at Zach Morrison 18 on Twitter and Instagram and all of those things. There's a guy in Hawaii that has at Zach Morrison. He doesn't tweet. He doesn't do Instagram and he's just been sitting on it and it, it drives me insane. But so Zach Morrison with an 18 at the end. Um, yeah, I mean, Canusa Street, we're, we're working on another L.A. screening. We're working on some more East Coast screenings. As of now, our next screening is up in um, Ely, Minnesota for the Ely Film Festival. Uh, which are very excited to be back on the Iron Range because they welcomed us uh, with open arms to produce the show. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to trying to a make more of Canusa Street and b show it to more people. And so uh, that's kind of going to be my my gig for hopefully most of this year. Fantastic. No, and I, uh, I, I'm hopefully I'll see you on, you know, at, we'll cross paths a little bit. I'm I've got a book tour that I'm trying to plan for mid year. And so I'm sure I'll probably, you know, go to some festivals as part of that. And uh, and if we do cross paths at a festival, that means that maybe other people can get my signature in a book and yours. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, and whatever congrats, kind of congrats couple... on the book, by the yeah. way. I've never been in a book before. So this is really, really cool. Yeah, you know, I, I it's uh, the the more the closer it gets, it, the more real it feels. Um, but um, I, and, and I haven't announced this even like on Twitter or anything yet. But like I saw like the pre order page on the 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 website and it's on on amazon as well um it doesn't have the but it doesn't have the um cover image yet so uh, for me it's not real till it has the cover image uh right. but um uh yeah but i'm still i'm working with the the publisher to finish the the end of that um like the uh the the index and then you know all, which i can't do until they do all the page layouts and stuff and everything but it looks like all of the the like the data part of everything is is done so that's really cool um, so hopefully I'll see you around on that. And, um, yeah, de definitely everyone should check out what, what, uh, Zach's doing. I think that, uh, Canusa Street was, it's really unique. It's definitely something that like in terms of a series, like is a, there's a, there's a gold mine there in terms of, uh, plot points and stuff like that to go. Did you already, I know I'm already, I, now I'm going to ask one more question. Go Did you it. play, you, you could be as long as, or, or short as you want. I'm not like on a time limit, really. It's the internet. Um, do you, did you do a, a like a story bible for it like that you could go like a couple of seasons or is it like you did the pilot and you have some ideas for where to go or you know but you know you haven't really developed everything yet i don't have like seasons two three and five like written but i mean the 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 work that i put into the pilot like it's it's very much it's procedural and it's network so the i, I made it with the goal being that like we can have 18 episode seasons, right? Like we're going to have the holiday episode and the bottle episode and the road trip episode. Like we kind of, you know, the show is built to have all of those like network sitcom tropes. Like that said, I do know, like I have the seat, I have all of season one. I kind of know what season two is. Um, and then, but also like, again, part of it is like, I want to, I have these ideas but I want to write them with other people. Right. And I want to like, you know, and I think some of the funniest jokes in the, the actual pilot came from these like mini writer's room sessions we had at lunch, not like a formal thing. We were just sitting at the table and everyone was just like throwing jokes at each other. And there's a bit where uh, there, there's a smuggle, a smuggling, the salmon smuggler is our bad guy. And, you know, you also call a smuggler a mule and our our beautifully stupid uh, sidekick uh, makes the the mistake that he thinks a salmon mule is like a mythological creature. <laughs> and there's a there's a joke where they're they're like doing door to door. Hey, have you seen this man? And he he pulls up a sketch of this like half salmon, half mule thing. <laughs> and that was and it was like we built a whole scene around this joke, and we set it up in the beginning of the show, and it pays off midway. 
And that was literally a, a that was a, a bit that happened just from lunch, just like from the the writer's room process of getting creative people in the space and, and punching up the story. And we were supposed to shoot that scene in 20 minutes. And I was like, okay, uh, this is great. I'm right. And I was, I'm like scribbling down on like my napkin with my like, you know, sandwich. And we go to like immediately went to art department. It's like, Hey, can you like make up this thing and print it? And I, I was like typing up in final draft and like print out, sent pages to the AD, like, Hey, new pages, we're rewriting the whole scene. And so we rewrote that scene, like within 20 minutes to shoot. Cause I'm like, this is funnier than anything I would have written and anything I had on the page already. So um, I, like, I'm really looking forward to not only making more of the show, but doing it with other super funny people like the, yeah. to, to, to put the writer's room together for Canusa street is, will be the greatest the greatest thing if and when it happens. And you absolutely just made the argument as well for having the writer on set, um, you know, so that they can, they, they can affect the, 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 the you know, the, the scenes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, uh, uh, yeah. That for, for those of you who aren't in the know, that was another uh, kind of a point of the strikes um, because they didn't, they were keeping writers off sets and, well, how the hell do you think rewrites happen? Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank you again for coming on, man. Uh, hopefully you feel better soon. Uh, again, <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, Zach. I'm slowly dying on screen right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel bad. I'm like, wait, well, one more question. Uh, <laughs> um, as you just slowly skeletal. Uh, but I want to thank you again. I want to thank Zach for coming on. I want everyone to follow Zach on the Twitters and the Blue Skies and the Threads and the LinkedIn's and the whatever. Check out Canusa Street, obviously. It's all over the place. Uh, so is... Uh, Mr. Zach, uh, when he's not feeling like absolute dog shit. Um, you can follow us, filmsnobbery.com uh, is, is our website. You can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com. Well, no, it's uh, not Twitter anymore, huh? It's X. Um, uh, Twix. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, follow us on X. Uh, we're at Film Snobbery there on threads. I think we're film. See, now that is where I get confused. I know on Instagram, we're film underscore snobbery. Because that's yeah thing, and I think we're at Film Snobbery on Threads. I don't know if it uh, whatever. Um, at Film Snob on YouTube, you can watch all our, our previous uh, interviews and previous shows. Uh, the uh, uh, playback for this episode will be available on our website tomorrow. Um, also, check out the other uh, podcast that we put out called Bolted Slugs, hosted by Zeus Ryan. That is also very funny and informative. And uh, I would. Uh, encourage everyone to um you know just keep following us and checking us out if you want to come on the show email us reach out i always like having guests i like talking to new people i like talking to this guy um so uh that's about it uh everyone have a great night and we will see you next week where i i you know what i know who our guest is uh vivian kerr I think it's Vivian Kerr. Anyway, uh, if it isn't, it's Calvin Vanderbeek. Um, it's one of those two people. I don't have it in front of me. Shit happens. That's what happens when you don't do a show. When you do a show and you don't have everything in front of you. Because uh, I'm dumb that way. Everyone, have a great night. Thank you again, Zach. See you next week. Bye.